Today we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I pray that your hearts are encouraged and filled with the joy of the Lord as we celebrate this remarkable and historical event. As a Christian, we have come to embrace the whole of God's Word as absolute truth. The resurrection is, is an absolute truth. It is a fact, and we can rest in it. We can trust in that. I want to talk to you today about the resurrection of Christ and the complete salvation of God as a result of it. We're going to be looking at Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 10. It says, Now after the Sabbath, the Sabbath was over, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, which would be Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. What a wonderful picture we get there, huh? of this supernatural intervention by an angel from heaven. heaven. And, and accompanying that, of course, was an earthquake, a great trembling. Verse 3, his appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. Remember, Pilate had stationed guards to keep watch over the tomb, and the tomb had been sealed and now was guarded by uh, these Roman soldiers. And it says, for fear of the angel, the guards trembled and became like dead men. They didn't even dare to move. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go tell my disciples to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. <laughs> Can you imagine for just a moment the fear and joy you don't normally put those two words together, fear and joy, that these ladies were experiencing as they approached the tomb of Jesus and all of a sudden they see this angel descending from heaven. They feel the earth quaking and, and the angel sitting on the stone that was to be rolled back. Oh, what a wonderful picture we get here. And then as they meet Christ and they run to him quickly with fear and great joy, again, taking hold of him. Uh, we'll get into that in just a few moments. Um, let's pray. Oh, Father, gracious Heavenly Father, we praise you for this wonderful celebration of the truth of your word found in the person of Jesus Christ who died, was put in a tomb, but now is alive. We thank you that we serve a risen and living Savior. And he's alive today. Blessed be the Lamb of God. Oh, Father, I just pray that you would so illumine the hearts of those who hear the gospel today in this wonderful event all around the world. And Father, I pray that you would imprint these truths to our hearts. Lord, that the discouraged would be encouraged. Lord, that those who are depressed, Lord, would be lifted up in Jesus Christ and find rest for their souls. I pray for those who are hearing the gospel, not just in this venue, but in all the places around the world where it will be proclaimed that 
for those who are unsaved, that they would come to Jesus today and receive him as who he is, Lord and Savior. Father, there are many things that we do not understand. I ask that you would give us understanding. There are many things that we feel we are lacking. Only you can fill us. May you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Here at Christian Life Fellowship, we do not celebrate the resurrection of Jesus just once a year. And I'm sure, hopefully anyway, that your churches don't as well. You see, our entire ministry stands on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we live in the light of Jesus Christ every day, as a constant each and every day of our lives. His resurrection is our focus, as it should be, to the true church of Christ. At this time of year, the world stops and recognizes the historical event of the resurrection. And every year, when we get to this point, it seems as though the television begins to be filled with documentaries that are de designed to question and cast doubt upon the resurrection and try to give it some form of a practical perspective while dismissing its truth. John MacArthur says of that, that's not surprising, he says. He says, a few years ago, some supposed archaeologists and scholars and journalists said that they had discovered the family tomb of Jesus and in it they found his bones. Actually, I can remember when that happened. They suggested that this discovery should not be disturbing to the Christians. In fact, the fact is, rather, that Jesus' bones were still in the grave. It, it shouldn't take anything away from their experience, they said, since it really was the idea that his spirit rose that gave life to the religion of Christianity. Obviously, MacArthur says, that is bad archaeology and bad journalism. It's bad history and it's bad theology because a few days after that was broadcast across the world, it was pulled from television when it was recognized that the entire thing was a fraud. The whole thing was debunked, never to appear again. Not surprising, because denying the resurrection has been a major enterprise for Satan. And that we realize that here in our text of Matthew 28. Before we really look at the resurrection, let's not forget Calvary. Let us view the cross for just a moment that we not forget the price that was paid for our salvation. The price that was paid in order for you to have your sins forgiven as you believe in Jesus Christ and put your faith in Christ. Let's not forget Calvary, the horrific display of inflicting severe pain on a human was certainly demonstrated at the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross always, always, always represents a most agonizing and delayed form of death. The cross, the death on the cross was designed by the Romans, as history tells us, to be a drawn out and agonizing, painful and torturous death. It was designed to inflict horrendous agony. And we know that Christ abused such torture and affliction at the hands of soldiers prior to going to the cross when he was beaten. Uh, he was lashed 39 times and his body beaten by the soldiers and a crown of thorns placed on his head. But through all that, we must realize the whole scene of Calvary we, we spoke a week ago on Christ's dramatic and triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the unfolding of events through what, what, what we call Passion Week, and now we have just stood at the foot of the cross to see the agony that our Lord suffered. 
And here's the fact. Jesus chose the cross. Jesus chose to die on the cross. It wasn't something that just happened because of circumstances of his life. It didn't just happen. Jesus chose specifically to go to the cross. As awful as the scene of a brutal cross was, Jesus chose this way. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, in the latter part of verse 2, it says, Who for the joy, speaking of Christ, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Here in Hebrews chapter 12, the latter part of verse 2, we find out that we are right here at the cross. Why did, why did the cross happen? Jesus chose the cross. Because of the joy set before him, he despised its shame, and he is now, now, as a result of the resurrection and the ascension, seated at the right hand of God, who for the joy set before him. How could the cross mean joy when it meant such horrific torment and pain? It is because Jesus was looking forward to what we call Good Friday, it, it, it was more than that. Jesus was looking forward to what we celebrate now as Resurrection Sunday. Resurrection, the first day of the week. Jesus knew what would be accomplished as a result of being the sacrifice of sin. Jesus saw all that would be completed as a result of him carrying out the Father's will and going to the cross, going to the tomb, being raised again, spending 40 days here on this earth before ascending into heaven. The only way that mankind could be reconciled to God was through a sinless and unblemished sacrifice. Jesus was that sinless and unblemished sacrifice, being the Son of God. What Jesus accomplished through the cross and the empty tomb is the complete salvation of God. I want us to understand here, though, we've, we've been talking a lot in the past, over the past few weeks, several weeks, actually, about the divine providence and sovereignty of God. We find that at work here, what's going on here, that Jesus was orchestrated in every event down to the very details of his death. And we know that Jesus, while on the cross, would not die. He would not die until he had taken the full brunt of sin in his body to fulfill the will of the Father. Jesus would not die, would not allow himself to die, until he had experienced the full brunt of sin in fulfilling the will of the Father. You see, he was in control of when he would give up his spirit to death. Jesus said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down on myself and I take it up again. So we find in, in that statement, along with others, that Jesus was involved in his own resurrection. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 to 11, let's turn there. Hebrews 10 it tells us, consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. What Christ did on the cross was the ultimate and final atonement offering of sin whereby mankind can be redeemed. You see, it wasn't in the blood and sacrifices of bulls and goats according to the law the old law, the Mosaic law, but now this once for all sacrifice being through Jesus, the Son of God, the sinless Son of God, would be the finality of any and all offerings. There would be no more offering for sin. Jesus accomplished it in his body. And the writer of Hebrews says, and by that will, the will of the Father, 
Jesus fulfilling the will of the Father. He says, we have been sanctified. Those who put their faith in Jesus Christ, those who believe that God raised him from the dead, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. You see, only when all of Scripture was fulfilled would Jesus say these famous words, these three words, it is finished. It is finished. What is finished? His, his, his earthly life? He's going to die now. His life is over. It is finished. No, it didn't mean that whatsoever. It meant that the complete plan of salvation was fulfilled. It was fulfilled. In John 19, verses 28 to 30, it says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill Scripture, I thirst. He said, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Although Jesus declared it is finished, however, we know, we know that there are are two more events that had to take place for all of Scripture to be fulfilled. And this is the amazing and wonderful thing about what Jesus said on the cross. It is finished. We know that the resurrection had to take place, and we know that the ascension, the exaltation of Christ had to take place, as we just read in Hebrews chapter 10, that he is now seated at the right hand of the Father. We know that in his ascension, he is now seated at the right hand of the Father. And we know that the resurrection and the ascension had to take place in order for all things to be finished. And what Jesus was saying, it is complete. It will be complete. It will be accomplished. Not maybe. Let's wait and see three days from now if Christ will rise from the dead. Let's wait and see if that happens. Jesus was not living in that form of anticipation. Jesus was living in the assurance of the perfect will of the Father. And he understood the will of the Father. And he knew that he would rise. He knew that he would ascend. Because he is the Son of God. We need to remember that Jesus came to fulfill the will of his Father. And Jesus knew that the resurrection would happen. So what does the resurrection affirm, as I've already said? I want to talk to you for a few moments about the complete salvation of God. Wilhelmus Brackel, an old Puritan writer, says this. He says, The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the cardinal doctrine of our Christian religion. As salvation hinges upon the faith in and confession of this truth. L listen to what he's saying. As salvation hinges upon the faith in and confession of this truth. What truth? The truth of the resurrection. Your faith as a Christian, your confession also of Christ, hinges upon this truth. Our faith in and our confession of this truth hinges upon whether or not Jesus Christ would rise from the dead. And we know he did. We know he did. You know, my belief in the gospel doesn't validate the gospel. The unbeliever's Rejection of the gospel does not void the truth of the gospel. Rather, the unsaved remain unsaved, and those who come to faith believe it, whether they do it or not, it is still the validated, truthful word of God. God doesn't need you or me to accept or to reject his truth in order to validate it or it's voided out. No, God's word stands on its own because it is the word of God. God's word is truth. And we find that, that that is also affirmed in the resurrection, is the truthfulness of the word of God. The resurrection gives veracity to the truth of God's word. We know that Resurrection Sunday, as I've said earlier, is the high point of Christian celebration, the, the high, high days of Christian celebration. When we consider Christ's birth, his life, his ministry, and his death, Nothing of all that Scripture claims of Christ, even the mighty miracles that he performed, would amount to anything whatsoever without the resurrection. You see, the resurrection 
affirms the complete salvation of God. We know that Jesus claimed, claimed to be the Son of God, that he would die and rise again. And only if Jesus was who he claimed to be, then would his birth, his life, and ministry, his death, mean more than we are probably able to comprehend in this life, and we find great joy in pursuing it. That is because everything about Christ's earthly life from his birth to his death, is tied into the resurrection. And of course, following the resurrection is his ascension. It's all tied in together, and it's all completed in Christ. And when Christ completed all that he came to do, he sealed for us, for those who put their faith in Christ and believe on him, he has given to us the complete salvation of God. Jesus said, he says that I and the, Fa and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. He was thus declaring that he was the Son of God. We know that Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. He claimed that as being the Son of God, he would die and that he would rise again. You know, this is one of the things that Jesus said that enraged the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the chief elders and of which they would seek to put him to death because they said he was a blasphemer. Jesus declared to Martha when he went to the tomb of Lazarus, he said to Martha because she was so distraught with her brother's death and, and Jesus had a discussion with her about the resurrection she said, I, I know that he will rise in the last day, in the resurrection of the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. We find that in John's Gospel, chapter 11, verse 25. Now listen to what Christ is saying. Not only was he the Son of God, that he and the Father were one, and he made that claim many times throughout, throughout Scripture that are, that are recorded in the Gospels for us. But in being the Son of God, he's saying that in, in himself was life, resurrection life. And what that means for us is, yes, he, he is the first fruits of those who have died. He came back, he was raised from the dead, never to die again. Lazarus would die again. All the others, the, the few others that are named in Scripture as rise and being called back from the dead, they had to die again. Jesus will never die. Jesus says, because I am the resurrection and the life, there will be a future resurrection where you will be raised as a Christian, just as Christ was raised. Because he makes that promise to us here. He said, everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. It tells us in Matthew 16 and 21, Jesus had just taken his disciples to Caesarea Philippi. And it's where, that's where Peter made the great declaration when Christ asked, who, who do men say that I am? And then Jesus says to them, his apostles, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, thou art the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to Peter, uh, that, that Simon Bar-Jonah, blessed are you because flesh has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. And upon that truth I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And he went on to talk about that for just a few moments. And he says in Matthew 16 and verse 21, he says, From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and, and be killed and on the third day be raised. And even though Christ was telling his apostles these things, describing to them what must happen, they didn't understand it. They did not understand it. They would not understand it until the other side of the resurrection. You see, all that Jesus did in his life, from his birth, a, mir a miraculous birth, yes, marvelous, in his first heaven, he came, born of a virgin, conceived of by the Holy Spirit. He lived his life in ministry, and what a wonderful and powerful ministry he had. 
and then he dies. And, and, and none of that would mean anything if the resurrection did not happen. Because if the resurrection would not have happened, then, then what would all of what Jesus did have accomplished? Nothing, nothing whatsoever. All we could have said of him, as the critics say, he was a good man. He was a prophet. Or we could believe the, the, the simple illustration that I, I, I shared with you at the, the, in my introduction was what those journalists and archaeologists said. We found the tomb of Jesus and his bones are in it. Well, Jesus was more than just a good man. Jesus was more than a prophet. Jesus is our high priest, and he is our eternal king. Scripture says he is the king of kings. But if Christ had not been raised from the dead, eventually Christ would have faded into history. We wouldn't be here today as Christians. We wouldn't be talking about this today if Christ had not been raised from the dead. You see, without the resurrection of Christ, the plan of salvation would never have happened. It has nothing to do with it being complete. It would have never happened. And if the plan is not complete, then what could it accomplish? Nothing. It couldn't accomplish anything. As someone has said, it takes a whole Bible to be a whole Christian. So I say it takes the literal bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ to complete the salvation of God. That was the plan from the beginning. That was the plan from the beginning. You go back to Genesis and you read of the fall. That was the plan of God from the beginning. That there was a plan of salvation already in place. Speaking of the providence and sovereignty of God that would be played out in the life of Jesus Christ. You know, this is crucial to our faith. No one, no one can claim to be a Christian without believing in the literal, bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. You cannot. You can't be a Christian and say, yes, I believe that Christ lived and that he died, but I really can't grasp the resurrection, then you really can't grasp salvation. You're lost in your sin. As we, we read earlier, our faith in and confession of the truth of the resurrection is hinged on that fact, that truth. You see, the resurrection is foundational to Christianity. The resurrection is foundational to everything the Bible has to say and instruct concerning God. Everything. So when I say, what is it, the, the complete salvation of God, what does that really mean? The, the, the resurrection affirms for us the complete salvation of God. What am I saying? As Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. That is, Jesus paid the full penalty, penalty of our sin on the cross. Was his sacrifice, was his sacrifice enough to satisfy the demand of God for salvation? You see, God demanded atonement for sin before any man or woman could be reconciled to him. We go back to the Old Testament. We understand that in the law of Moses. The high priest would make atonement for himself. He'd make atonement for the people of Israel. Then he could go into the presence of God. But if there was no atonement, he would die the minute he stepped foot in the presence of God. God demanded atonement for the sin of every man and woman in order to be reconciled to him. The law could not do that. The law could no longer do that. The sacrifices of animals, the blood of bulls and goats could no longer do that. Jesus, being the Son of God, as John the Baptist described him as the sinless Lamb of God, was the only one who could go and offer a sacrifice that would appease the wrath of God. Was his sacrifice enough? Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Jesus' sacrifice satisfied the wrath of God against us. 
You see, and we can only receive that as we come to Christ and receive him. Jesus says, and the Bible uses a big word, propitiation. Jesus is the propitiation. He is the sacrifice that satisfied the wrath of God against sinful mankind. And we put our faith in him. When we put our faith in him and believe upon him, we come to God the Father through Jesus Christ. Because of Jesus' resurrection from the dead, we now can, by grace and through faith, be saved. That is, to have our sins forgiven, and we are made right before God in the person of Jesus Christ. You know, in and of ourselves, we are unrighteous. Isaiah says that our righteousness, our self-righteousness, is like filthy rags. Filthy rags. Horrible rags. And what he was referring to in using that statement of filthy rags, he was talking about a woman's menstrual cycle. Yeah, I, that gets a little detailed, doesn't it? But that's exactly what Isaiah was implying. I, our righteousness is as filthy rags. It could not be accepted by God. And when we come to Christ because of the resurrection, because of the complete work of salvation, we are forgiven of our sins. We are clothed in his righteousness, and that's the only way we can be accepted. It tells us in Ephesians 2, 8 and 10, what's taking place. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of works, so any man should boast, it says. And what are the blessings we, we have? Well, let me just share this one verse with you, Ephesians 1, 3. For the child of God now, I'm talking about the child of God, okay? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Wonderful. Wonderful benefits for those who know the complete salvation of God. As we read earlier in our text, Matthew 28, let me go back there. Matthew 28, we know that Satan has attempted to debunk the truth of the resurrection from the morning that it happened. We know that it says here in Matthew 28, verse 4, And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. Well, if we just left it at that and there was no more said about it, we'd say, yeah, well, we can only imagine if they saw, too, what the women were seeing, that they would be full of fear. But it goes on to tell us down in verses 11 to 15, while they were going, while the women were going to tell the disciples, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. Now, the guards are bringing a report of the actual event to the chief priests. That, that's, that's just mind-boggling to me because the guards are testifying to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, to, the, to those chief priests. In verse 12, and when they, when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell the people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. How would they know it was the disciples then um, if they were sleeping? And, and they go on to tell the guards, and if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. You know what, what that means? These soldiers were given a command by Pilate. They sealed the tomb. They were guarding the tomb. And if anything were to happen to that tomb, if it was to be opened and the body stolen, they would forfeit their own lives. They would be executed for it. So now the chief priests and elders have counseled together to pay these soldiers off to tell a lie and to protect them from being killed. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And Matthew says, and this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. What day? John wrote his gospel some 20 to 30 years later. This gospel was written. 20 to 30 years later, that story is st was still being circulated among the Jews, is what John is saying. You see, destroying Christianity requires that you destroy the resurrection, and that's exactly what Satan has attempted to do throughout the years, the many years. So eventually, all those who attack Christianity attack the resurrection. 
Because in the resurrection are all the central realities of Christianity. The truth of the resurrection for 2,000 years has been the foundation of true Christianity. The truth, the truth of the resurrection for 2,000 years has been the foundation of true Christianity. And you know something? That's never going to change until Christ returns. It's always going to be the foundation of true Christianity. You know, if you destroy Christianity, in order to destroy Christianity, you have to destroy the resurrection. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12 to 19, Paul is instructing the church at Corinth, and he says, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? You know, he's dealing with what they're believing here as Christians the saints at Corinth, the Christians at Corinth, how can you say there's no resurrection from the dead if, if Christ is proclaimed as being raised from the dead? How can you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. If Christ has not been raised... All that we are doing now, what I'm doing right now, is in vain. It's ridiculous. It's foolishness. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, Paul says, because we testified about God that he raised Christ when he did not raise, when he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. So what Paul is saying, if Christ has been raised, then we have a future resurrection for the, for the saint of God, for the Christians. For those of our, our loved ones that we know in this present time, who have died in the faith, they have a future resurrection promised to them that is sure to happen because Christ has been raised. But if we say there's no resurrection of the dead, I had a man tell me one time as a Christian, he said, oh, I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. I really do. He said, but I do not believe there's going to be an actual bodily resurrection of the Christians. It's going to be a spiritual resurrection. That is not what Scripture teaches whatsoever. You might as well say there's not going to be a resurrection of the Christian. And if we say that, then Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead. And that is not the truth. We know for a fact, because of what the Bible teaches, that Christ rose from the dead. The empty tomb and the, 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 the physical appearances of Christ after the resurrection in the body that he died in is proof of the resurrection. He goes on to say, he said, uh, your loved ones, if they have died in Christ as Christians, if there's no resurrection, you're never going to see them again. We, we are cast into complete despair without the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If there's no resurrection of Christ, there's no forgiveness of sin, there's no hope of heaven, there's no escape from eternal judgment. And you know, I, I believe that if there was no resurrection of Christ, if Christ had not come and died for our sins and rose again and ascended into heaven, we wouldn't even care. We wouldn't even be talking about these issues. It wouldn't matter. But it does matter today because this is true. It does matter. And it's important that we realize that and that we proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ to those who are around us. You see, the complete plan of God's salvation is necessary for an individual to be saved. You cannot be saved and not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That, that's, that, as, as Wilhelmus Brackle said, we find in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, there are the two conditions right there. Not necessarily in that order. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I believe it's Romans uh, 10 and verse 10 that puts it in the order. If you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and confess with your mouth. Those are two conditions. You must confess, you must believe that God raised Christ from the dead. Our salvation is dependent upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
And as I said, resurrection is at the foundation level of the Christian faith. If there's no resurrection, Christianity is worthless. It is a lie and a deception. But because of that central importance of the resurrection, it has been assaulted relentlessly by the enemy. Try, Satan is attempted to debunk it continuously. You see, the complete salvation of God means that we are reconciled, we are reconnected to God as our faith is in Jesus Christ. I have a, a Bluetooth device, it's called the Jabra Extreme 2, that sets in your ear, and, and this device is connected to my Galaxy 9 Android, 9 Android phone. And, and with this device, I'm able to take phone calls without having to hold my phone to my ear. And I can be roughly 90 feet away from my phone and still take calls, still talk on this device. And, and it's what I used to hear before I had Bluetooth in my automobile. And uh, when I turn this little device on, there's a, a, a lady's voice that comes on and says, power on, connected meaning the device is connected to my phone and it is now working, I can use it. However, if I get too far from the phone, if I get more than 90 feet away from my phone, the lady's voice comes on and says to me, disconnected. I think she sounds a little more harsh than the power on connected, but that's, that's me, okay? And what this means is that I'm separated from my phone and I cannot use it. I won't hear it ring. I, I, I can't talk to anybody. So what I have to do is I have to move in the direction of my phone, and when I do, the voice comes back on and says, connected, connected. So in other words, I have to stay within a certain proximity of my phone in order to stay connected. I, this is a simple and very thin illustration at best, but it is intended to help us understand that sin has separated humanity from God, and our only hope of reconciliation to God, to be reconnected back to God, is in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and in His resurrection and in His ascension. You see, we need to be connected to God. We need to be reconciled to God. And Jesus is our connector. Jesus is our connector. If you are not born again, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are still living in your sin, you're still separated from God, you are disconnected from God, and you need salvation. In John 14 and 6, Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. It is in Christ Jesus only that we can be reconciled to the Father. We, we have this familiar passage of Scripture that most of us know in John 3.16. I want to read to you John 3.16-18. through 18. It says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. He loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes, there's one condition, whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Whoever believes, they should not perish. Only if they believe will they not perish. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. You see, outside of Jesus Christ, you live in the underneath the wrath of God. You are already condemned in your sin, but if you cry out to Christ, if you come to Him, put your faith in Him, believe that God raised Him from the dead, and confess Him as Lord, you will be saved. The Word of God tells us in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. It, tell, it goes on in Romans 8 to tell us that Christ came to condemn sin in the flesh in order to set us free. Christ is our connector. Christ is our mediator. Christ is our Savior. That's why he came to die. That, that defines the complete salvation of God. And it is because he rose from the dead that we can trust him to reconcile us to the Father and receive his forgiveness and receive eternal life in him. You know, there are four words that one will say that will either affirm your faith in Jesus Christ or these four words will content, condemn you to eternal punishment. These four words are simply, I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. 
You can go anywhere in the world today, no matter where you are, you can talk to people who are unsaved and they'll tell you, I believe in Jesus. And that is not an affirmation of their faith in Christ. That is saying they have a brain knowledge, a head knowledge of Jesus. And yeah, I can believe in him, but I want nothing to do with him, really. And I say that because I don't live my life according to the biblical standard of what it means to believe in Jesus. You see, the Word of God tells us that for God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We live faith believing our lives in sync with his life according to what we understand in the scriptures. And so when people say that, that will stand in judgment against them when they stand before God and give an account of their life. If all they have said from a head knowledge is, I believe in Jesus, all they're going to hear at the judgment is, depart from me for I never knew you. But for those of us who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we say it from the heart because we truly believe it. I believe my faith is in Jesus Christ. And one day, you too will stand before him and he'll say to his children, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter in. Enter into what? Into eternal life, into his kingdom. The Bible gives us the wonderful truth of God's complete plan of salvation. You see, God had given his son to be born, live, die, rise from the dead, and ascend into heaven is his complete plan of salvation. When you get saved, you get the full, the full package of salvation. Your sins are forgiven. You have eternal life in Jesus Christ. You have heavenly blessings. You are blessed with heavenly, heavenly blessings because of what Christ accomplished for you. In Acts 4.12, Peter, the message is saying here in Acts 4.12, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Salvation is found only in Jesus Christ. So what are we to do with this truth in closing? What are we to do with this truth? If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, simply accept Him. Accept Him. Ask the Lord into your heart. Let me ask you two questions for that. Number one, have you put your faith in and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation? And number two, this is a hard question for you to consider, but it's a question that is necessary. If you were to die today, do you have the assurance of spending eternity with Christ in heaven? When you say, I believe in Jesus, do you really mean that? Or is it just lip service you are given to it. You see, as the resurrection of Jesus Christ is central to Christianity, we need to trust what the Lord has done. And it, it takes faith. We need faith. Faith in Him. And as a Christian, what are we to do with this truth? Continue to live it. Live it. Live it. Live your life each and every day in light of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let Christ be your focus. Paul said, I would know nothing among you, he says to the church of Corinth. I would know nothing among you except for Jesus Christ and him crucified. And Paul desired that he too would someday attain to the resurrection that is found in Jesus Christ. So as Christians, what are we to do with this truth? Continue to live it and to live it according to a biblical standard. Once we belong to Christ, we belong to him. We are no longer our own. We represent Jesus Christ. Let us live it. Oh, I pray that God's truth would just permeate your heart and your soul today. I pray that you are rejoicing in our resurrected Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen.